Welcome back Life Science Learners to another installment of Life Sciences. Trust that you're well and you're excited about our lesson today. In our lesson today, we're going to be focusing on the abiotic and the biotic factors in an ecosystem. Let's get straight into the concept of the lesson and unpack what biotic factors are. So, as I mentioned, in our lesson, we're going to review some important terminology and then we're going to spend some time having an overview of the biotic and abiotic factors. It's important that we review some important terminology that is used. So we have come across the word ecology before, and ecology essentially refers to the study of the relationships between plants and animals and their non-living environment in which they live. It's important that we recognize that plants and animals interact with each other, but it's also the non-living environment that we say that influences their existence. So it's important that we recognize the abiotic factors when we study ecology. The next concept is ecosystems. An eco refers to ecology, and systems would be obviously an association. So this refers to the specific area in which the abiotic and the biotic components are interdependent and interact with each other. So essentially it shows you the interaction between the non-living and the living components in their habitat or in their specific area. The concept of abiotic, so biotic refers to living organisms, so the abiotic refers to the organisms that are non-living or the parts of an, of an environment that are non-living. So let's look at that. So the non-living components of an ecosystem that make up the environment, this would include the soil, the climate, temperature, sunlight and water. And we will pack, unpack that in detail in a bit. The other concept is biotic, and that's quite simple. It's the living components of an ecosystem, and that would include all the organisms that interact and are able to carry out life processes. And then finally, as a recap of the term biosphere, bio meaning the living, and the sphere refers to the earth. So that part of the earth where humans and other organisms are able to live and interact with each other. So the bio biosphere, we've got to remember. So when we talk of the biotic components, again, it's important that we remember that living organisms form the biotic components on the three spheres of the, of the Earth. So the Earth has three spheres, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, and the atmosphere. And those living components that inhabit these three areas are referred to as the biotic components. As I mentioned, the abiotic components were the non-living components, and these would be the constituents of the environment, so it'll be the soil, the pH of the soil, the types of soil, it would refer to light, it would refer to the temperature of the area, so these would be the non-living components that influence how these biotic factors or organisms survive. So it's important that we understand that life on Earth gets the energy from the sun, and this space in which the three spheres interact with each other is where life exists. And so we know that as a recap of the earth, it's got the lithosphere, which is the soil and its different parts, the air, which would be the atmosphere and, and the gases that support life, as well as water, which is part of the hydrosphere and how that supports the diversity of life on earth. And so this is the interconnectedness of the three spheres that we often refer to as when we talk about the biosphere. The interaction between the abiotic and the biotic components is what forms a global ecosystem, and that's what we need to unpack now. So when we talk of the biotic components, we're referring to all living organisms, and these are essentially broken up into the following two main categories. Broadly speaking, we have autotrophic components and your heterotrophs. The concept of autotrophs comes from the word auto, meaning self or be able to develop or der drive themselves. So the concept of autotrophs is derived from individuals that are capable of producing their own food. And your heterotrophs refer to those individuals that are relying on your autotrophs or your consumers. So it's important that we recognize that your, your autotrophs are your producers. What do we mean by producers? These are the individuals that are able to produce energy in an, an ecosystem. So energy from the sun, which is right, light or radiant energy, are used by the producers, in this case plants, that are able to use the carbon dioxide 
as well as water to produce sugar in the process of, during the process of photosynthesis. And that is important in also producing oxygen that we rely on as living organisms. It's important that we recognize that there are several different types of autotrophic organisms. We often are associated autotrophs with just plants. Remember guys that there are more than just plants that produce their own food. And the ability to produce your own food is a characteristic of being an autotroph. So there are cyanobacteria that have the ability to produce food because they have chloroplast in them. We know that there are certain photosynthetic protists, algae, that are able to produce energy by using radiant energy from the sun. As I mentioned, plants are your autotrophs that photosynthesize. We mentioned algae as we discussed protist. And finally, we also have some chemosynthetic bacteria. And so these are bacteria that are able to use chemicals from the environment pr to produce energy. So not necessarily using photosynthesis, but using chemicals to produce energy. So we refer to them as, again, your chemosynthetic, meaning that they use chemicals to produce energy, as opposed to your photosynthetic, meaning those that are using light to produce energy. So guys, that's a wrap for this segment. We've looked at your biotic components. We've tried to unpack them in detail. We mentioned specifically in this segment, we refer to the autotrophs, and we discussed that these are individuals capable of producing their own food. Plants being the predominant source of energy on Earth, but it's important that we recognize that there are several other organisms that produce energy, some of which are your protists, such as algae, which live in your aquatic environments, your phytoplankton, as well as your zooplankton. It's important that there are some bacteria that also produce energy, not necessarily using sunlight, but using chemicals from, the, from their environment. And so those are your chemosynthetic bacteria. So that's a wrap for this segment. When we get back after a short break, we're going to be looking at your heterotrophs as part of your biotic components. See you in a little while. Have a short break and catch you soon. Welcome back life science learners to the next part of this lesson. We've just focused on the biotic components. Let's continue with more of the biotic components and look at understanding how these biotic components exist in their environments. So as we mentioned, autotrophs are your first group of biotic components. It's important that we recognize that autotrophs form the basis of any food chain. Let's look at what is supported by the autotrophs. Essentially, looking at the next group called the heterotrophs. So these are groups of individuals that first group we look at are the consumers, and these are the first group of heterotrophs. Consumers, again, are organisms that cannot manufacture their own food, and they rely on energy from the food that they eat. We do not use the term animals, as this includes bacteria, fungi, protist, and animals. So, so when we refer to consumers, I think we generally tend to use the word eat and link that to the word consume. However, if you look at fungi and protists, they're not necessarily in organisms that eat food. We refer to them consuming, and the concept of consuming refers to how energy is being used or transferred from a producer to an individual that uses that energy. So it's important that we recognize that consumers are not just individuals that eat other organisms, but where en energy is transferred from your producers, which would be plants, and some of those other producers, to individuals that are now going to access that energy. So we find that right at the bottom of the food chain, or we find that we have our plants and we have the producers. They then convert the energy and make that en energy available to a first group of consumers. And these are individuals that cannot access their energy from the sun and rely on consuming the producers. We also use the term heterotrophs. And this again refers to organisms that cannot manufacture their own food. So autotrophs, capable of producing food, whereas your heterotrophs are those that are not capable of producing food, but rather 
consume energy from other organisms. So consumers are also named according to what they eat. And so when we look at a food chain, we know that there are different levels of organization where we have individuals right at the bottom of the food chain, or we refer to them as different trophic levels or levels of organization. So firstly, let's look at our primary consumers. And the word primary, again, is the first level of consumers. So we have different levels of consumers and accessing energy at different points in a food chain. So the first level of consumers are your herbivores. And the word herbivores essentially comes from the term herbs, which refers to plant diet. So these are individuals that consume plant material. So our herbivores, generally we living in the context of the South African environment, we know that we have your hooved animal, your ungulates, which are predominantly a large group of animals that roam the savannas, the grasslands, and they feed on the grass. And so based on that, we know that biomes are generally having a variety of different primary consumers or herbivores. And here we've got a, a wonderful image of a, a wildebeest consuming grass. And here we've got some springbok that are consuming some of the grass. The next group of consumers in our heterotrophs we would talk about are those that eat other consumers. So we know that we have our primary consumers that consume plants, but our next group of consumers, we refer to them as secondary. So this would be the second level of consumers. Okay, so these, um, there, are any, there are many forms of life that does not eat food. The heterotrophs need to consume some of the other organisms for their food. That is why they are called consumers, we mentioned that. And these secondary consumers are generally all mammals, which include rept and also reptiles, birds, and insects, all fungi, including mushrooms, as well as many bacteria, are called heterotrophic consumers. Let's look at this infographic or picture that shows you different consumers. So we know that we have sometimes worms or the larvae of different stages of development that consume plant material. And so here we've got a caterpillar that's feeding on, on the leaves of a specific plant. And these again are called herbivores. We also have some of our rodents, such as rabbits and other animals that eat plant material. In this case, you've got a rabbit that's feeding off the flowers of a cactus plant. Again, consuming plant material. The next group of consumers we also know are called carnivores. And these are animals that consume other consumers. So in that we have different levels of consumers, but carnivores have a, have a diet that's predominantly based on eating other consumers or meat eating. Okay, so we have carnivores, even birds can be carnivores. And then we have a group of consumers which we call your decomposers. And your decomposers are those that are, play a significant role in their environment in terms of the process of consuming what is left in terms of in the environment, the organic material. And we'll unpack those in a little while. So your herbivores, these are heterotrophs that eat your autotrophs. They are plant-eating animals, which are also known as your primary consumers. Cows, springboks, bees, and cattle are a large group of herbivores. Your primary consumers, there are other organisms besides animals that get their food from plants. And we mentioned that earlier on. Yes, bacteria and protists feed on living plants and are termed plant pathogens. So we do know that there are certain bacteria that feed on plants. We know that there are certain fungi that feed on plants that cause disease. And so we will look at the term parasites in a bit. So yes, there are some bacteria and protists that feed on them. Microbes, microorganisms, another word for microbes, feed on dead plants, and these are called your saprotrophs. So again, these are not autotrophs. They feed on dead plant and animal material. So the term saprotrophs refers to organisms that feed on dead organic matter. And these, these could include the remains of plant material or the remains of animal material that's undergoing a process of decomposition. Right. The next group that we mentioned earlier on are called carnivores. The carnivores essentially are your group of heterotrophs that consume meat. 
Right, so heterotrophs that eat other heterotrophs. They are animals that eat other animals. They are known as the secondary consumers, so in terms of their level of organization in the food chain, you've got your autotrophs, primary producers, you've got your primary consumers above them, and then you have your secondary consumers that are consuming your primary consumers. Okay, so they feed on the primary consumers. And when they feed on herbivores or they feed on tertiary consumers, they essentially are called carnivores. Okay, so feeding of other consumers. Examples of these are your cheetahs, lions, wild dogs, many of your cat species, hawks, eagles, and even some insects are carnivorous. We also have some plants that are carnivorous. So the example would be the Venus flytrap, and that is a plant that produces enzymes that allows it to be able to consume some of the insects that visit them. Okay. The next concept is an omnivore. So this is a group of heterotrophs that consume both plant as well as animal material. So they're able to produce, consume autotrophs as well as your heterotrophs. Examples of these are, we are a classical example of omnivores. So we have a diet that consists of both plant material and animal material or heterotrophs. And so one may question, why is that important? It's important that we have a balanced diet and that links to the availability of nutrients from plants that supports important processes which provides us with nutrients as well as the essential building blocks that we need to make other organic compounds. So we need the plant material as well as we need some of the proteins that we get from consuming the other heterotrophs. Okay, so bears, pigs, crows, uh, even your Larger ground finches are all omnivores, so they consume other insects as well as they consume plant material. Another important group of consumers are called scavengers. So scavengers are generally those uh, individuals or organisms that feed off other organisms that have been left behind. So you find that predators kill their prey and they will consume as much as they can. But the remains of those kills are often left to decompose and so we have your scavengers that scavenge the food of other predators and so here we have a vulture that's an important part of the environment because they are responsible for utilizing some of the nutrients and energy and returning it back into the nutrient cycle so your consumers that eat the bodies of dead animals or plants and so these have the ability to consume the remains of dead animals and plants and we refer to them as scavenge Examples of vultures, you have your burrowing beetles and your blowflies that all are part of your important group of organisms called scavengers. Some carnivores will engage in scavenging on occasion. Examples of your hyenas, your jackals, even lions and leopards, the polar bears and wolves. So you find that scavenging is often a, a very selective behavior to be able to access food. Sometimes we know that your hyenas will, will steal or scavenge off a kill that lions have had. And so that's a quick access to food. And the reason they do this is because probably it's much more easier to access that food by intimidating a single solitary predator that has killed a large prey. And hence we see the reason why often predators hunt together in packs. One is they bring down bigger prey, but also they're able to protect their kill from other scavengers. And so your hyenas and jackals and even your wild dogs often can be seen as uh, predators, but also scavengers that will fight off other predators for access, quick, easy access to their kill. Okay, another group of consumers are called parasites. We often don't look at these as consumers, but remember that parasites are individuals that live off a host, and they live off that host being able to access the energy or food from that host. So parasites also belong to a group of heterotrophs. So organisms that live on another organism, taking nutrition and shelter from them are referred to as parasites. Generally, the parasite benefits at the expense of the host. So when we refer to as a parasitic relationship, we know that the parasite is the individual that lives on a host, accesses nutrients and shelter, and causes harm to that host. So we find that a parasite typically does not kill their host. Unlike a predator, 
A predator will want to kill its prey and consume it. Parasites live off their host and gradually extract nutrition, shelter and protection from them at a cost to the host, often inflicting injury, pain, sickness and suffering to the host. So it generally is much smaller than the host, so they're much smaller and they're able to access food and affect the host in many ways. They often live in or on the host for an extended period of time. Parasites could be large parasitic animals as well as large parasitic plants. So when we look at um, your macroscopic parasites, we're referring to those that can be seen with the eye. Here we've got an image of a flea on a domestic pet, that is a dog. And so these are fleas or ticks that live off dogs that actually excess the blood and that nutrients are what the fleas need. We also see here, this is the gastrointestinal tract of a dog and this is we seeing the image of a tapeworm which is a parasite found in the digestive system. So examples of this would be roundworms, tapeworms, ticks, lice, fleas, even parasitic worms such as your helminthus and many wasps are all part of your large parasites that feed off animals. What's interesting is that we also have much smaller parasites that cannot be seen. So your microscopic parasites, and these are often pathogenic, for example, some of your viruses and bacteria that cannot be seen with the naked eye. So these include your protozoans, so things like your malaria parasites, as well as bacteria that cause your normal gastrointestinal infections, as well as viruses that are parasitic. Your larger plant parasites would include plants that live off other organisms that do not contain chlorophyll. And so they obtain their food from their host plants. So certain creepers are parasitic. So they live off another plant, extract, send through roots into their stems and extract the nutrients, affecting the existence of the host and in many ways advancing their ability to survive. So yes, we do have parasitic plants, and often these parasitic plants affect how other plants grow. A classical example would be weeds, and often the weeds during agriculture form a, an extensive part of affecting the crop. And it's because they utilize the nutrients from the soil, as well as prevent these plants from reaching optimal growth. It's important that we recognize the decomposers in any ecosystem as part of your consumers. And so your decomposers essentially, as I mentioned earlier on, are an important part of any ecosystem. Here we've got an image that illustrates your protist, in this case your fungi, and some bacteria that are an important part in the ecosystem. What do they do? These are organisms, as we mentioned, bacteria and fungi, which break down plant and animal remains and returns the nutrients to the soil. It's important that we understand that there are various types of biotic components and interactions. So we find that many organisms associated with each other, that relationship is called symbiosis. And so biotic components often live and interact with each other. There are different levels of symbiosis. One is what we've just spoke about, parasitism. Parasites living on a host, where the host is affected and the parasite benefits. The other relationship that we look at is called mutualism. And mutualism is where bees and flowers coexist, the spider crab and algae. And we've got some good bacteria in our, in our digestive systems that ensures that we survive. Now that is a mutual relationship where both organisms benefit. So we're having the association between living organisms both benefiting. As I mentioned, you've seen uh, ox peckers on rhinos and they play an important role in being able to clean the fleas and the pest on them, giving the rhino an, a relief from these pests. But the woodpecker in turn also benefits from that. Sorry, the ox pecker, not woodpecker. We also have a relationship called commensalism and here it is a relationship where, between two living organisms where one benefits while the other neither benefits nor is harmed. So the host is neither benefiting nor harm from the relationship, but the, the, the individual that benefits is often at an advantage. 
And we see this with the Remora sucker fish, where they live off and they stick against shark. And as the shark feeds, these bits of food that, that leave the mouth are consumed by these Remora sucker fish. The shark is not affected in any way, but the, the Remora sucker fish certainly benefits from that association. And finally, we mentioned parasitism early on, and again, we discussed that and how these individuals benefit from that association. Welcome back life science learners. Let's continue with the lesson on biotic and abiotic components. In this segment, we're gonna focus on the abiotic components of an ecosystem. So what are the abiotic components broadly classified into? There are three sections that we look at. We first, we're gonna look at the edaphic factors, which are again related to the soil. The second would be the climatic factors, which would be factors in the climate, such as temperature, pH, as well as we're going to look at the physiographic factors. And the physiographic factors are essentially the layout of the land. So that would include things like the altitude, slope, and the aspect. But we'll unpack each one of these in a bit more detail. So let's look at, firstly, the edaphic factors. As I mentioned, these are factors that refer to soil and its properties. Now, what do we mean by soil and its properties? Remember that the abiotic factors are the non-living components, but these play a significant influence on how they support life forms. When we look at soil, we know that there are different types of soil. We also know that soil has the ability to hold water or retain water. So we'll have to look at the soil water. Soil is also affected by pH, and that is obviously how acid or alkaline the soil is. And that in turn influences the growth of plants as well as other organisms that live in that area. We've got to look at the air content of soil. As we know that plants that grow have root systems that require the oxygen and the air for healthy growth. We also know that there are invertebrates that live in soil that need that air. So a combination of air as well as the type of water in the soil and the amount of water influences life. Humus of the soil, and if we, refer, if we refer to humus, we're referring to the organic content of soil. So the greater the humus content, the greater the fertility of the soil, as well as the minerals present in soil. When we look at the climate, we're going to look at light, temperature, water, the atmospheric gases, as well as the wind, and how they influence living organisms. And finally, the third group would be the physiographic factors and as I mentioned this refers to the landscape or the lay of the land and we would look at the aspect, the slope as well as the altitude of that environment. So as we look at edaphic factors we're going to remember that these are all factors that refer to the soil and as I mentioned this is what we're going to be unpacking now. So let's look at the pH of the soil. pH is generally a measure of how alkaline or acidic the soil is. The pH of the soil often determines the types of plants that grow in there. And we do know that pH plays a significant role on enzyme functioning or how proteins carry out their function. So soil that is extremely acidic or extremely alkaline may not necessarily support the growth of plants or other organisms in them. So we know that most plants grow best in a neutral pH or slightly new alkaline or, or al acid pH. And that is what is often going to influence how plants live. The humus content, again, is the organic component of soil. And these are essentially made up of dead plant and animal materials and bacteria and fungi. And we do know that the more the humus content, the more fertile the soil is. So we know that soil that is fertile has a rich humus content. And so the humus that is there is a result of plant and animal material that have decomposed in that soil. The next factor of soil or edaphic factor is the texture. And based on the texture of soil, we have different types of soil. We've got sandy soil, we've got loamy soil, 
and we've got clay. And that's essentially got to do with the texture of the soil particles. We know that clay has extremely fine soil particles and hence the particles tend to stick together. Whereas sand has got coarse and rough particles that tend to be easily separated. And we know that loam is a mixture of sand and clay with a rich humus content. And of the three, this is the most suitable form of soil that supports life forms. The ability of water to, to be held in the soil also influences the biotic components. So when we refer to soil, we know that soil supports the existence of other living organisms. However, when there is soil that is filled with water, it would be very difficult for gases to exchange. So we find that the water retention capacity of soil also refers to how much water the sample can hold. So water dissolves minerals, salts, and are found between the spaces. So the water retention capacity depends on the texture of the soil. And based on that, soil that is made up of clay has a high water retention capacity. Soil that is predominantly made up of sand has a low water retention capacity, with the most suitable soil having a balance of clay as well as sand and a mixture of humus in it. And that would be your loamy soil, which has the ability to be, retain moderate amounts of water, providing enough of aeration and minerals for the living parts, which are the plants. Okay, the air content again is linked to the spaces between the particles. And so we know that the loam soil has a moderate amount of air and that allows for good gases exchange for the roots, as well as for organisms that live in the soil. However, clay will be particles that are tightly packed and hence the, the air content will be significantly low. Okay. So guys, as we looked at this component, we've looked at the abiotic factors in that we've unpacked some of the edaphic factors. And the next component we're going to be looking at would be the climatic factors. Well guys, that's a wrap for this segment. We've looked at the edaphic factors. As I mentioned, we're going to come back and look at the climatic and the physiographic factors. A quick break, get some oxygen in those muscles, and I'll see you in a little while. Welcome back guys. Let's continue work looking at abiotic factors. We've looked at the edaphic factors. Let's move on to the other factors that influence the living organisms in their environment. So the next group of factors are the climatic factors. The first factor we're looking at is light. And we know that light is important for one of the most crucial processes of photosynthesis. We often tend to focus just on plants. However, it's important that we recognize that even animals are affected by light. So let's try and understand the importance of light to living organisms. So light is essential for the process of photosynthesis. We know that our producers rely directly on that light. However, light may be a limiting factor because sometimes when we have excessive light, it may damage plant tissue. So there are different types of plants that require different amounts of light. And so we have plants that use a lot of light during the day and some that prefer to have less light. And so based on that, we can have an overview of the impact of light. So the length of the day, which is the duration of exposure, affects when a plant flowers. We know that some plants will flower when the days are short. And we refer to them as your short day plants. Okay, we'll look at those in a little while. While others flower when the days are much longer in summer. So let's look at that. Based on that, we have our short day plants, and these require shorter durations of exposure to light. Some of these include your strawberry plants, as well as your poinsettia. The others would be plants that prefer long day plants, so they require long exposure to light. Examples of these include the carnations and some of your spinach plants. However, we have our day neutral plants, Example, the sunflower plants and even your rose plants that get along through the day with whatever sunlight they're exposed to. So not very sensitive to sun, provided that they get 
most of the sun during a day, they would be sufficient in terms of producing these beautiful flowers. We also know that the light intensity may affect the opening and closing of flowers and leaves. So here is the image of the evening primrose, and these tend to open up towards the evening when the light intensity decreases. So they're quite sensitive to light. Some flowers, such as the fuchis, they close when the light intensity decreases, and others, such as the evening primrose, open when the light intensity increases. So these plants tend to open up when the light intensity increases, and your primroses tend to open up when the light intensity decreases. Again, these plants are sensitive to light, and that affects how they grow. The next climatic factor is temperature. Guys, as we experience different temperatures, we know that animals also are affected. Plants also are affected. It also affects the growth of seeds. So temperature plays an important role in influencing living organisms. So the temperature that plants and animals are exposed to vary significantly between night and day and even between seasons. We know that in certain areas, such as deserts, they experience hot days and cold nights. We also know that there are seasonal changes from summer to winter where the temperatures fluctuate significantly. So some animals and your herbivores, such as the ones that consume large amounts of plant material, survive in winters while others migrate to warmer areas. And this is essentially to look for either food that is more available during the winter seasons or to avoid the harsh environmental temperatures that may be experienced due to a decrease in the temperature or change in season. We also know that some plants lose their parts above the ground and remain dormant underground in the form of bulbs, tubers, and rhizomes. And this is a mechanism where they store the energy in these structures and survive the cold, unfavorable seasons and then germinate during the next season. So we know that winter is, a, is very hostile in certain environments where some plants cannot withstand the extremely cold temperatures. And they do this by forming structures that allow them to survive. So your bulbs are storage structures, your corms, such as your garlic plants, your rhizomes and your gingers, and even your runners, as well as your tubers, such as the ones in, we see in potatoes and yams, are all structures that allow plants to be able to survive some of the changes in temperature and allow them to reproduce when temperatures are conducive during the spring seasons. The next climatic factor is water, and water is a vital uh, for all living organisms. Plants are adapted to this with regards to the availability of water into three groups. Your hydrophytes, your mesophytes, and your xerophytes. And that's based on the availability of water. Let's look at your hydrophytes. So the word hydro refers to water. And so these are plants that are adapted to living and growing in an abundance of water. So your water lilies and your water hyacinths are plants that grow predominantly in water. The next group are your mesophytes. So the mesophytes are plants that grow in areas with moderate amounts of water supply. Most of your fruit trees, um, your wheat and your maize that you see growing around are plants that are generally your mesophytes. So when you go out into your garden and you see these plants, they require moderate amounts of water. However, we also have the xerophytes. And xerophytes are plants that are adapted to growing in extremely dry conditions. And these are often found in dry, arid, desert conditions. And so these include the cacti as well as your succulents. Here you can see an image showing you some hydrophytes here, where you see these water lilies growing. And they are obviously adapted to being able to survive in these. So they have a thin cuticle, in fact, absence at all, because if at all, because they don't need to conserve water. They have a very um, uh, underdeveloped root system because they rely on the water and they easily absorb the water from the, from, from the bottom of their leaves. These are your succulents, and these are plants that have thick, fleshy leaves that are able to store water and often seen in dry, arid, hostile conditions. And so your xerophytes usually have, if you look at these, these are your cacti and different types of cactus plants. They have thick, fleshy leaves that can absorb and store water to survive during extremely dry weather. They often have leaves that are reduced to thorns and very small leaves, as you notice here. And these leaves reduce the surface area for the loss of water. 
They often have a thick cuticle with a sunken stomata. So the upper layers have a thick waxy cuticle and you will notice that in your aloe plants where a white layer forms and that's the thick cuticle that actually prevents the transpirational loss. On their lower surfaces, they have the stomata that are sunken into the leaf and that again reduces the transpiration rate during the day. What's also key is that they have well-developed root systems that grow deep into the soil so that they can extract water from the lowest parts of the soil. So these are adaptations of plants that are xerophytic to an area where the water availability is significantly less. Animals are also adapted in many different ways with regards to the availability of water. Here we've got an image of a kangaroo rat, which basically never drinks water, but it gets most of its water from the food. And so that's an adaptation that it has, where it lives in dry, arid conditions and relies on the food that it gets to acquire water. Desert animals such as the camels, they excrete large amounts of urine that is very crystal, crystallized. So you'll find that they form, the urine forms crystals, and this is to retain much water as possible. So these are adaptations of animals for living in dry conditions. We know that insects have a large, thick exoskeleton, and that prevents, again, the dehydration of organisms. We know earthworms rely on moist, damp soils. So again, the availability of water can influence organisms significantly, and accordingly, they have adapted to living in these different environments. The next factor we're looking at is atmospheric gases, and we know that the air that we, we inhale consists of different components, and these all influence life forms. So air is made up of 78% of nitrogen, 21% of oxygen, 0.04% of carbon dioxide, and we have approximately slightly less than 1% of the other gases, which include argon and some of the other gases. And collectively, the, that atmospheric composition of gases influence how organisms survive. So all li living organisms, except your anaerobic bacteria, require oxygen for cellular respiration. Anaerobic bacteria are those bacteria that can survive in environments with no oxygen. And so they have the ability to use carbon dioxide for cellular processes. So green plants need carbon dioxide for photosynthesis. Your terrestrial organisms require oxygen, and that oxygen is used for cellular respiration. And that is their ability to be able to use the oxygen to produce energy in the form of ATP. And so we need that environment producing large amounts of oxygen. The next factor we're looking at is wind. And wind, again, influences several factors. So the movement of air currents in the atmosphere is known as wind. Wind is very important for the following reason. It will assist in the process of pollination. Plants require pollination to occur in order to be able to survive and produce more. So pollinators are, in the, are organisms or agents that transfer pollen. So wind is a significant pollinator of plants. It also aids in the dispersal of light seeds or fruits. So wind allows for the dispersal of seeds. And you often find in your pine, you find the seeds are released and these leaves, seeds have adapted to being able to disperse from the plant that has produced them. Fruits are often, your smaller fruits are often carried by wind. And this allows for the dispersal of plants into a variety of different habitats. We know that wind transports rain, hail, snow, and sand in the atmosphere. So wind often carries the rain, it carries some of the snow, and so it plays a significant distribution of some of the other abiotic factors. Wind, however, accelerates the process of evaporation and transpiration, and thus resulting in living organisms losing water more rapidly. And so you'll find that often wind influences how plants have grown and in terms of, in that way, you'll find there are certain structures that allow them to reduce the loss of water from, the from uh, evaporation. And so we see the development of thick uh, thorns, reduced leaves, or thick fleshy stems, as you would see them in the aloe plants. The next factor uh, that influences biotic factors are your physiographic factors. As I mentioned earlier on, 
This refers to the lay of the land. And there are three factors that we look at. Aspect, slope, and altitude. Let's have a quick overview of what aspect is. Aspect is the direction in which an area faces the sun. And so this is significant when we talk about the axis of plants to light. So the aspect is the direction which an area faces the direction of the sun. So if you look at this illustration, you'll find that when we have the sun coming in from the northern hemisphere, the slopes on the southern side are much cooler than the slopes on the northern side. So we would find the growth of plants very different in this region compared to the south facing slopes. And so in South Africa, the sun shines from the north. And this means that the north facing slopes are exposed to the direct rays of sun for much longer periods during the day when compared to the south facing slopes. Okay, so this means that the north facing slopes will be hotter and drier, while the south facing slopes will be much more cooler and moist. And so this in turn affects the growth of plants on the north sides and the south sides. And that factor we refer to it as is called the aspect of the environment. Here we can see an image that shows you two a, a little valley which has a slope that is experiencing significantly much more light than the slope on this area. And this is a clear image showing you how the vegetation varies in that area. So you'll find that this influences the growth of plants. The concept of slope is of the land is how steep or the gradient of the area. And this influences how the water flows between the different slopes. So soil on steep slopes tend to, tend to be relatively infertile because, because of these steep slopes, the water runs off significantly faster and hence does not allow for the retention of the nutrients. And so you, this would be significant in areas that are mountainous or hilly. The last factor we look at is altitude. And altitude is again the height above sea level. And what we know about altitude is that as altitude changes, we know that it affects the atmospheric pressure, which decreases, the temperature decreases, as well as the oxygen levels decrease. So when we talk about altitude, we know that as altitude increases, it's going to affect the availability of oxygen, it's going to be much cooler, it's going to be greater in terms of atmospheric pressure. In turn, this means that all other living organisms inhabiting these areas will be affected. Guys, as we wrap this segment up, we've looked at the three factors that influence light. We've looked at the edaphic factors, we've looked at the physiographic factors, and then we've looked at the climatic factors. It's important that we recognize that all three of these abiotic factors influence the biotic components significantly. It's interesting that we noted that many of our living organisms have adapted in their unique ways to be able to survive in their environments. You've been a fantastic audience, guys. We've looked at abiotic components. I trust that you guys have enjoyed the lesson. I wish you well. Have a bio day. See you soon.